I'm very happy. In the previous video about the Su-75 Checkmate, I asked for the trolls to come out of their caves and leave comments. And they did it! It is so funny. Look at what they left. Well, that was great. However, many more people left respectful comments and observation or asked interesting questions about the aircraft and the Russian aerospace in general. So get prepared for a sweeping ride where we are going to discuss your points, not mine. So, Otis, please. On the topic of modern composites, the Russians lag far behind the US and West. Yes, Russia lags behind the Western aeronautical industry, but not far, far behind. Russia doesn't lack the chemical or structural know-how to manufacture composites. In the civilian sector, they are commonly used and the industry is quickly expanding. In the military aerospace sector, though, they started late, so it's not clear, for example, the level of tolerances that they can reach or what they can bake into the composites in terms of typically of radar absorbing materials or other features. The Su-57 panels, though as far as we know, are quite sophisticated. And by the way, the leading composite industry in the world is in UK and France, uh, not in the United States. Here is all I need to know about the Russian arms industry. Russia has to overestimate on their stat sheets otherwise they wouldn't be marketable or competitive. I love your work but I can't help but be skeptical about anything Russia claims. I hear this objection times and times again. This is a logical fallacy. First, according to the same logic, I could say that I don't believe that the NGAD program exists. I don't believe that the F-35 could do even a quarter of what they claim. Or I don't believe that the AM-260 is a real thing. Where is the proof of their existence? Where is the proof of their performance? You understand that we don't get very far with this, okay? Second, always according to the same logic, what makes you think that we know everything? What makes you think that the Russians don't have capabilities in reserves that they are not using or showing on purpose, like the Americans are supposed to do? Take the famous comparison between the Rafale and the F-35 made by the Egyptians. Many took it at face value immediately with no verification, while there are serious reasons to doubt it ever happened. This is simply prejudice. It's not even worth discussing anymore. The only AI plane currently is that test F-16 with an AI pilot. Well, the Turks may have something to say about this, but however, the Su-75 is the first aircraft designed with the possibility of being built as a high-end UCAV as a variant of the aircraft itself. It's not a different vehicle that operates with the aircraft, like for example for the GCAP or the SCAF, it is a variant of the same aircraft. Su-35 and 57 have both the capability of executing a mission without the pilot intervention except for takeoff and landing. It is not just an autopilot. The system can fire weapons and react to simple and immediate dangers. We may expect some more sophistication from the Su-75, actually. I seriously doubt that this thing is going to amount much. The Su-57 couldn't be produced before sanctions and they have less than 10 over a decade, etc. So, two interesting points here. The effect of sanctions on Russian economy is not what is represented in the shared version of mainstream media. And there is no secret here, the data are publicly available, and while there have been a few doubts at the beginning of the war, not one international outlet is questioning them now. It is simply news that don't appear in mainstream media. You have to look for them. So the Russian economy is growing, substitutions kicked in, and the financial stability is not in danger. They're now decoupled to a very good extent from the Western economies, so they are even less vulnerable than before. And about other countries rejecting the Su-75, I personally have heard no news of that. The commercialization is indeed going to be hard, there's no doubt about that, but I don't believe it's going to be impossible. And as I said, it may turn out quite important even for the Russian Air Force. 
Su-75 Checkmate will be a couple of decades behind the sixth gen aircraft that we release. Well, the two aircraft will be more or less contemporaries, to be honest. Well, they are two very different concepts, for sure. We may expect that the NGAD will include more sophisticated technologies, more advanced, but that's natural when you compare something that is designed to be the absolute best with something that is expected to be cheap. This aircraft, at least as shown, is not stealth. The exhaust is completely open, IR exposed, the flattish underside, etc. <sighs> Did you check the F 35 exhaust? Is basically the same design. In this case, the F 35 is not stealth as well, I suppose. And the angle you mentioned on the F 35 is even closer to 90 degrees. The F 35 probably, according to my interpretation, trusts the rather absorbing materials much more than the Russians do. So it actually seems to be a bit less stealthy from a geometrical point of view. And indeed it's true, the Russian rum coating is still a question mark. Russia can't even build more than a handful of their Su-57s. They are destroying their economy with the invasion. Gap tolerance is extremely important in stealth aircraft, so quick removal wings would be a bad idea. We have already discussed the economy and we will discuss the aircraft production, but let's talk about the gaps and the tolerances. Very tight tolerances are a good idea, particularly if you are using composites, because they allow for better control on the structural loads, thus increasing the structural life of the aircraft. When it comes to stealth though, what prevents reflections to be emitted back is that the local impedance of the skin doesn't have abrupt variations like it happens near a rivet hole or at the junction of two skin elements. One possibility is to fit everything together with extremely small tolerances. The other is to cover the junction with a conductive material that doesn't cause discontinuities. It is the reason why on the F-35 you see those light grey bands. So it's not impossible to conceive an elastic filling between the fuselage and the wing that minimizes the problem. This subject has been covered already in the videos about stealth. I invite you to have a look. And I think that this story about the tight tolerances come from an episode happened during the development of the F-117, but it is quite misleading if taken at face value. While this plane looks like an exact copy of Western technology, there's nothing new with Russia and China. They just steal technologies, etc. Russia and China literally just copy US weapons. Ah, the copy argument. An old friend that appears again and again. First, there is a logical fallacy again. If it's superficial, reminds a US creation, shame on you, it is a copy. If it doesn't and it looks original, shame on you, you can do better than the US in the same game. That's what happens. And honestly, the Su-57 and the J-20 do not resemble anything American, I believe. Second, why are you surprised to see convergent designs when the problems that the designers are trying to solve are the same? The rules of geometric stealth or aerodynamics do not change with the flag. It is natural, it is obvious that they look the same sometimes. They are using plasma stealth powered by Chinese MHD technology. Slavarosa. Ah, of course, and there are obviously those who stand on the other side of the fence who tend not to be much better. Plasma stealth exists. The Russians had a functioning device which is not in use because it is tremendously impractical and requires a lot of electrical power. It is a system to hide the radar antenna when not in use. It was tested on a Su-35, but as far as we know, it is not on serial aircraft. Again, there is an entire video dedicated to this subject. Another thing often mentioned in this context is the photonic radar. If someone is capable of explaining me how it is supposed to work in a believable way that doesn't contradict a lot of known physics, well, I will be grateful. If you got this far in the video and you liked it, please do the usual YouTube stuff like subscribe, hit the bell and so on. It is a great way to show your appreciation and it is completely free. If you could consider supporting the channel on Patreon or by becoming a member, you will have access to the sources I'm using for the videos and other material that I prepare and I make available to the supporters. You will also have access to me personally for a friendly chat, ask questions and so on. And now on with the video. Why are there air intakes on the tail nacelles? So these are air intakes for cooling some 
components of the aircraft. It could be radiators for the hydraulics part of the engine or electronics. In this specific case, there is also an APU in one of the nacelles, which definitely needs an airflow to work. The actuators for the flaps may actually be in the body of the plane, etc. So the Su-75 doesn't seem to have this arrangement, but a rather classic complex of hydraulic actuators. The F-35 has small electric compact actuators that move the surfaces. There is no report of the Russians working on this type of actuator, which is a bit strange because it shouldn't be a terribly complex technology to develop. I guess Pakistan will buy this aircraft if J-35 didn't come to export market. This is an interesting comment. The Chinese J-35 could be the Su-75 rival in the export market. However, it is necessary to understand the exact comparison of the two aircraft and the capabilities that they are putting on the table. Moreover, the Chinese will likely have an advantage in terms of costs for the same performance, so the jury is still out. I have no doubt that Russia has always been able to design and develop outstanding aircraft. Their issue is the one you do not bring up. They have no access to modern electronics. There are two different issues in here. For sure the sanctions have created problems for the Russians to have access to the most advanced silicon. However, like it always happens with sanctions, when imports are not available, substitutions kick in. While it is difficult to replace the systems like for like, we know that the Russians have started to redesign their weapons that depend on sanctioned components. The process is not straightforward and there are indeed issues, but it is ongoing. What must be clear is that the process is not stopping Russia from doing anything, including building the Su-57. The aircraft production in Russia has accelerated with the economy going on war footing, but not as much as other industries. The losses from the beginning of the war amount to about 80 jets, but the production likely doesn't reach 30. And this is obviously an issue, because with combat aircraft, it is much more difficult to refurbishing and upgrading and old aircraft and still get some useful capabilities from it. You need to produce new aircraft. Production in this case is very, very difficult to scale, because there is basically no industry more complex than building combat aircraft, and it is an industry where corners cannot be cut and still have a functioning product. UAC has expanded the current capability, but establishing, for example, an entire new assembly line may well require a couple of years. And the same is true for the logistic chain behind the production. The most sophisticated aircraft components have a lead time that is measured in years. So yes, there are problems in scaling the combat aircraft production. The Su-57 was never planned to be built in large numbers before the new engine was ready. And now the priority is probably even lower since the Russians need something that is fully operational to replace the current losses. In Ukraine, they are not up against F-22s or F-35s, but not even Eurofighters or Rafals, so the current 4++ generation is more than up to the task. It seems now clear that one of the reasons why the first production units of the Su-57 were so late was because parts of the aircraft were de redesigned to remove the dependency from Western components. So, no, it's not the lack of chips that is making the Su-57 production slow. It is an unfortunate combination of planning and circumstances. If the war in Ukraine doesn't become a forever war, I believe we will see a ramp up of the Su-57 production only when the new engine will be ready and the war will be over. Okay, these were a series of interesting points about the Su-75 and other connected subjects. However, you may want to have a full picture of this new interesting Su-75, because like many Russian aircraft, it is extremely interesting from a technological point of view. So just click on the video that is going to appear beside me to learn more about the Su-75. Thank you very much for watching and see you next time.